dear passes for the waters of my soul long as I thee you alone are my heart desires and I long to worship you oh you My brother, even though you are my king, I love you more than I, me other much and more than anything. Oh, you alone are my strength and shield. You alone makes my spirit yield. You my heart desires and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold and silver only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. Oh, you strength and shield you alone makes my spirit yield you alone are my heart desires and I long to worship thee Several things. Um, I want to start with Randall Morrison. Randall Morrison was a friend of mine. I cannot tell you the number of times he and I have prayed in my garage. And I can tell you this. I've never seen a man agonize over his call to preach, his love for River of Life Church, anyone the way that man did. So I loved him very much for that. And something some of you from River of Life may not know, uh, but if you remember, uh, well, when you came in, you look across the field, and you see out in the middle of that field that there is a, uh, a power supply. That power supply was put there in anticipation of the Tyler Blue Tent Revival. And I put the word out to all of the churches in Brunswick County for volunteers to come help ELA with that. And Randall was the first person that called. So whether you know you were volunteered or not, uh, you were volunteered. And the way we had it worked out is River of Life was going to help us man. We were going to have little tents in the fellowship hall so that all the kids, when they uh, came in, could have their own little tent revival going on and we had it set up with meals that would be served so we had it all set up when and what happened COVID so I just want River of Life to know that as far as I'm concerned y'all are on rain check for that <laughs> and uh, and we would love to have you help us with that with that again because I still believe as Randall believe and several of the other pastors that came together to help us put that together, that God still wants that in this area. Okay, um, something else. We have an, an ex-Elamite here. Where is Brian? There we go. And uh, to some of you, uh, I hate to say it this way, but older Ela people, uh, you might remember that the Bentons have been a big part of this church for many, many, many years. So we're glad to have you folks worshiping with us this morning especially. Third thing, folks, 
this is how we as Baptists do things. We decide who our leaders are going to be in our local churches. No one tells us who to bring into our churches. That is unbelievably precious. So what you're experiencing here this morning is God's man, God's people, seeking God's will. So, and that's why we're honored to have you folks here, to, here today. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. Uh, so with, with no further introduction, uh, Michael, you come forward and you close this service as the Lord leads. First off, I just want to say, uh, since the moment my wife and I arrived here, we have received incredible hospitality, friend, friendliness, and uh, kindness from everybody that we have met. And so I think the words that came to my mind were, this is the friendliest church I've been to. And uh, I just want to thank you guys for that. And uh, I want to thank you guys for that hospitality and that kindness. Pastor Kenneth is a, a wonderful pastor, a great man. And uh, I've heard about him through the association uh, for many years. And I uh, really enjoyed our conversation on the phone, and I know how much you love this congregation and your church, and we're thankful and honored that you allowed my wife and I to be here with you and your family and with this church. And so thank you for that. The late Dawson Trotman, founder of the Navigators, was visiting Taiwan on one of his overseas trips. Uh, during the visit, he hiked with a Taiwanese pastor back into one of the mountain villages to meet with some of the national Christians. The roads and trails were wet, and their shoes became very muddy. Later, someone asked this Taiwanese pastor what he remembered most about Dawson Trotman. Without hesitation, the man replied, he cleaned my shoes. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does greatness look like in God's eyes? I can't think of a more fitting passage that explains this than Mark chapter 10 verses 35 through 45. Will you open your Bibles, and if you are able, stand with me, please, for the public reading of God's Word. And please note that I will be reading from the English Standard Version. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant." And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Will you bow your heads in prayer? Father God, as we study your word this morning, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to each one of us where we're at, Father God, what you would want us to apply in our lives. Father, we're thankful that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to give us the example of which we should imitate. I pray that we, Father God, as your people, would listen to your word, obey it, and seek to live lives that would glorify you. Holy Spirit, may you increase and may we decrease, Father God, this morning as we study your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. 
This morning I've titled this sermon, What Does It Mean to Be a Disciple of Jesus? And I've added a subtitle, is What Does Greatness in God's Eyes Look Like? In the passage we're going to see, the disciples were viewing greatness according to the world's standards. Jesus is going to graciously redirect his disciples as he teaches them what it means to be his disciples and to be great in God's eyes. What I love about Jesus is that he's always teaching. I want you to think about that for a moment. He is always modeling discipleship through love and action. As we get started, let me give you a little background on the text. You see, Jesus and his 12 disciples, they're on the road to Jerusalem. And right prior to our passage we're going to study this morning, Jesus gives his disciples what would be the third and final passion prophecy, with this one being the most detailed and most precise. Listen to what Jesus teaches them in Mark 10, verses 33 and 34. He says, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. As Jesus is drawing near and near to the cross, the disciples aren't drawing near and near to their understanding of the purpose of the cross. It's as if his, ears, or his words are going in one ear and out the other every time he speaks to them about suffering. The expression Son of Man referenced by Jesus here is a phrase the disciples would know all too well from the Old Testament, from their knowledge of Daniel chapter 7, 13 to 14, where in Daniel, the Son of Man is described as a human being who comes with the clouds of heaven before God, who gives him authority, glory, and sovereign power, and who's worshipped by all nations and receives an eternal kingdom. Because of the disciples' understanding of this Old Testament passage, they didn't expect this exalted Son of Man to come as a lowly servant. They were looking for a conquering king. They were expecting glory, not servitude. This morning, I pray that you'll open your hearts to pondering what Jesus teaches it means to be one of his disciples and what it looks like to be great in God's eyes. And then asking yourself, is this what my life looks like? And if not, what needs to change? Let's first look at 35 through 37, the request of James and John. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. You see, these two bold and very proud disciples approach Jesus and they basically ask him to write a blank check so they could do with it whatever they pleased. They wanted to sit at his right and they wanted to sit at his left. You see the irony in their question. They're asking the one that they're following to serve them. From a positive side, they're acknowledging Jesus as their Messiah and they believe that once they arrive in Jerusalem that Jesus will inherit his messianic kingdom. You see, in Jewish thought, the right hand of the king was the place of the greatest prominence, and the left hand was second in prominence. James and John apparently expected Jesus to establish his kingdom and enter into his glory when he reached Jerusalem. For their own selfish reasons, they wanted to ensure that they received a prominent place when that time occurred. Essentially, they're hoping to honor Jesus while at, them, at the same time being honored themselves. James Edwards in the Pillar New Testament Commentary says, how easily worship and discipleship are blended with self-interest. Self-interest is masked as worship and discipleship. When we first look at this question they pose to Jesus, our thoughts and responses might be something like, I can't believe they would have the audacity or the arrogance to ask such a question of Jesus. 
I would never do something like that. And yet if we examine our own lives and our motives, how often do our prayers sound just like that of James and John? When we seek to join a church, how often do we come with the expectation of, well, let's see what you can offer me. Let's see if I like the way the pastor preaches. Let's see if I like their music. Let's see if I like the way they hug, give high fives, fist bumps, or handshakes at the door as I'm greeted. Let's see how friendly they are to me while I'm there. Let's see how good their children's ministry is, their youth ministry, and, and most importantly, what do you have to offer me? You see, friends, how often do we do the same thing in church today? We make church about us. And we too fall guilty of masking worship and discipleship with our own personal self-interest. Personally, I believe this is why many churches today look more like country clubs than battleships. So how does Jesus respond to this request? Well, let's see what he says in verse 38. Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? Notice the grace shown by our Savior. He doesn't tell them how bad they are. He doesn't walk away from them. He doesn't tear them down. He simply explains to them that they don't understand fully what they're asking, nor do they understand the implications of their request. James and John, they're quick to claim the benefits of God's kingdom, but they're slow to hear the cost of participating in it. If you're following along in the text, we see that Jesus speaks about its cost as a cup and a baptism. In the Old Testament, a cup is sometimes a symbol of joy and salvation, but more often it's used as a symbol of wrath. In this instance, the cup is used as a symbol of the wrath of God. The baptism Jesus is referring to is a symbol of being immersed in calamity. For Jesus, the metaphors cup and baptism signify his coming death. For the disciples, they could refer to martyrdom, but more than likely, in this situation, they're referring to any kind of suffering that they're going to experience because of their faith. Jesus is asking these two ambitious disciples if they were willing to suffer and die as he would do, to which they quickly and naively reply without hesitation. Look at verse 39, and they said, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I'm baptized, you will be baptized. James and John's quick response in answering his evidence, they still don't understand what it meant to be a disciple. They're confident in their own abilities as they, can, they believe they can endure a little hardship as long as they know it's going to grant them seats of power. You see, friends, they are looking at greatness the way the world sees greatness, as having power, position, or prestige. Jesus once again refers to the cup and baptism. He will receive as the will of God planned for him where he's going to give his life as a ransom for the many. The cup and baptism the disciples will receive is in regard to the persecutions that they're going to reap as a consequence of what it means to follow him. We can best read verse 39 as a reminder and a renewed call to discipleship which will eventually, eventually involve sacrifice and suffering. As disciples of Jesus, we accept suffering and hardships on the sole basis that this was the way of Jesus and this is the way of his disciples. It's not a matter of if, but when. When we suffer for being a disciple of Christ, how will we respond? Jesus adds one more statement to his response which shows his humility and his complete submission to his father. Look with me at verse 40. He says, but to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, 
but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. I love what James Edwards shared in the Pillar New Testament commentary concerning this verse when he said, The purpose of God cannot be thwarted, but neither can it be fully deciphered beforehand. The disciples are to follow Jesus not because they know in advance what's going to happen or because of what they're going to get in return. The rightness of their way is determined solely by the fact that it is where Jesus leads. Here I'm reminded of another passage in Mark chapter 4 verses 35 through chapter 5 verse 20 where Jesus commands his disciples to get into a boat with him to go to the other side. What the disciples didn't know was that a storm was coming once they would get out to sea. As they eventually got to the other side, Jesus encounters a demoniac man and delivers him and then commands the disciples to get back into this. takes his disciples through that storm for one man. That one man eventually spreads the gospel message, and the next time they came back, a whole crowd was waiting to meet Jesus. I'm not sure about you, but I would rather be in the middle of a storm with Jesus than on a sunny beach without him. The point, the point is, I must go where he leads. The other ten disciples are listening to the conversation between James and John and Jesus, and you can only imagine what they must be thinking at this point. So how did they respond? Look at verse 41. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant with James and John. Notice the ten's reaction shows they're angry. Most likely because they wanted the position for themselves and James and John had beat them to it, to asking that question. What's important to understand in this verse, though, is that their lack of understanding concerning the significance of the moment places them in the same category. As James and John. And so it points to the fact that while Jesus was bearing the weight of the cross and the road to Jerusalem, he was bearing it alone. The gracious and merciful Savior that Jesus is once again responds with patience towards his disciples. You see, Jesus uses this conversation as another teaching moment. As we move on in the text, look at verses 42 to 44 with me, please. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Notice Jesus brings his team together like a good leader, like the good shepherd he is. He knows that they're fighting amongst themselves. And so he uses this as an opportune time to bring them together to disciple them once again. On a side note, I think there's so much we can learn from this. In church at times, we need to rally the troops back together to remind one another that we're on the same team. We need to remind one another who we are as disciples of Christ, and we need to focus on the things that are most important. In this comparison and contrast, Jesus is instructing his disciples that that aspiring to places of greatness, that they were in danger of becoming like the Gentile rulers. Worldly rulers who lead by power, position, and prestige. So Jesus flips the script to their understanding of what it means to be great upside down by telling them that to be great, that they must become a servant and a slave. How many times have we seen this truth play out in the world we live in today? The desire for power, position, prestige. It focuses all of the attention on self, and that kills love. Why? Because Christ-like love is focused on others 
not self. There's nothing wrong with trying to become great at something, but how you go about achieving those ends is important. You see, Jesus wants to make sure that they understand that the Christian fellowship does not exist for their sake, but they for it. Nor is the pastor, the elders, the deacons, or any ministry leader above the congregation, but they are a part of it. The congregation doesn't belong to the pastor, but the pastor belongs to the congregation. Imagine the difference a church would look like if all of its members understood that being a disciple of Christ means being a servant and a slave of Christ. I imagine it would be a community where lost people would want to visit because it would be different than what they see in the world today. Look around at churches today that are looking more like the world than like Christ. I too fall prey at times when I'm in the world with my sons, with football games and other activities. It's so easy to get wrapped up into the things of this world and to forget who we're called to be. I need this reminder. As much as we all need this reminder. What part can we play in making that become a reality here at Ela Baptist Church? in Leland, in Brunswick County, and the churches where we belong. I was blessed to have a conversation with, with Pastor Kenneth, and I know his heart is to love and to serve and to lead this congregation from the bottom up. Has the Lord through the Holy Spirit revealed anything to you that has caused you to drift? It's caused your heart to drift away from Jesus, from serving like Jesus. Jesus wraps up this message with what many consider to be the heart of the gospel. Listen to what he says in verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The four at the beginning of this verse indicates that the disciples are to adopt the posture of a servant and a slave. Why? Because this is the posture of the Son of Man. Jesus was affirming to his disciples that his life was to be characterized by a servant attitude. Jesus was setting himself as an example for them to follow, one in which they should imitate. The word translated ransom was often used in secular Greek to refer to purchasing the freedom of a slave or a prisoner of war. The emphasis was on the price that was paid. In the New Testament, though, it no longer relates to a purchase price paid to someone, but it simply means redemption or release as a theological concept based on the experience of Israel's release from the slavery of Egypt. It also contains an allusion to the suffering servant passage found in Isaiah 53, especially verse 6. B, where it says, and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. You see, Jesus freely offers his life as a ransom price. Through his suffering, death, and resurrection, Jesus freely and obediently offers his life as a substitute on behalf of those who are his. And Jesus is supremely conscious of offering a payment to God that can be offered by no one else but him. The prepositional phrase for many is to be understood in the general sense of many as contrasted with the single life that is given for the ransom. So the entire phrase to give his life as a ransom for many is emphasizing the substitutionary element in Jesus' death. Jesus takes the place of the many as what should have happened to them happened to him instead. The death of the Son of Man on behalf of the many is a sacrifice of obedience to God's will, a full expression of his love and a full satisfaction of God's justice. The only thing I can think of in this moment is what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Church, you grab hold of that. What a mighty God we serve. 
One who would give his life willingly so we can have eternal life with him in paradise. What a mighty God we serve. I absolutely love the grace and the mercy Jesus shows in this passage. He could have been upset or angry with his disciples for their lack of understanding at this point and for their constant self-centered attitude. But instead, he lovingly and he mercifully disciples them as they're on a journey with him. How did this grace and mercy impact James and John? Well, later on in the scriptures, we see that John finally understood what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and to be great in God's eyes. As he says in 1 John 3, 16, he laid down his life for us and to be great, he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And then we know James finally got it as he was martyred for his faith and we see this in Acts 12, 1 to 2 where we read that King Herod killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. You see these guys, they finally got it. And so many other stories of the other disciples, they finally got it. When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they finally got it, what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus and what it meant to be great in God's eyes. Martin Luther King Jr. summed this heart of servitude up well, I believe, when he said, but everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You don't have to know Plato and Aristotle. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. Think back. I want you guys to think back with me, if you will, to the last menial or small or what maybe you considered insignificant task that you were given. Maybe you were given by your pastor. Maybe you were given it by one of the ministry leaders here in the church. And you thought maybe that might be below or beneath your dignity. How did you respond? How was your attitude? We know that God truly reigns in our hearts when Jesus' way of viewing life overthrows the world's destructive ways of living. As we wrap up, Looking at James and John is like looking in the mirror. We can see a little bit of our own selfishness. And Mark hopes that we can see how foolish we look. But there's one last catch that we must grab concerning the one who was ransomed. And that is, he or she became property of the one who freed him or her. Paul gets this in his admonition to the Corinthians when he says, You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Fellow Christ followers in the room, as we have been ransomed by Christ, we belong entirely to him. As we leave here this morning, may we reflect that truth in everything that we do. I pray that this morning as we have studied this passage, that as we as Christians have truly reflected And maybe for some of us, we just needed this reminder on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, to be great in God's eyes, and most importantly, what it means to have a servant for a Lord. I pray that we have been reminded that the greatest work ever done was accomplished by the one who gave his life for others. I pray that we have been reminded that self-giving service is the only greatness recognized by God. And only those who give of themselves for others will be big winners with God and his kingdom. May that be our heart as we leave here and go and be the church. Will you pray with me? Father God, as we come to a time of invitation, I'm not sure how... uh, how each person here needs to respond, but Father God, you know. Father, we thank you that you sent your son to die in our place. Father, this morning we're reminded that we don't deserve your love, but yet you freely gave it through your son. 
Father God, I pray for this church. I pray for this pastor. That, Lord Jesus, you would continue to use them, Father God, the way that you see fit. As they have servants' hearts and a desire to love one another, to love their community, their county, their state, Father God, and the world for Christ. I pray, Father God, as they would continue to have a heart for reaching those in addiction, Father God, you would bless their ministries and their efforts, Father. I pray for each person in this room, no matter where they're at in their walk with you, that they would be reminded of your grace and your mercy. Father, if there's any in this room, Lord Jesus, who have walked away, Father God, from their faith or, or maybe have abandoned it or just been sidetracked, I pray you would draw them back to the foot of the cross. And Father, for others who are walking with you but they've grown tired or weary, I pray right now, Father God, that you would refresh and remind them of who you are and that their strength doesn't, re, uh, doesn't rely on themselves, but it relies on you, our Heavenly Father and our Savior. And so, Holy Spirit, however we need to respond, I pray we would do so. And I pray, Father God, that you would speak to us. And I pray, Father God, that you would be blessed by your words that were spoken as we seek to strive and serve, to be disciples of Christ, to be great in your eyes the way that you see fit. Father, I pray this in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Pastor Kenneth.